Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Felix Lutsch, and today I'm speaking with Ilya, Ilya Simos, who is the co-founder of Rated Network. Rated is providing node operator metrics and, and ratings for the Ethereum network. Hi, Elias, and welcome to Epicenter. Thank you, Felix. Thanks for having me. Huge fan of the show since, since I joined the, uh, the industry, so very, very glad to be with you today. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. I'm also really excited to have you. We have a long history of like working together in in the staking space, and uh, yeah, I've been really interesting to follow your path. Uh, and now uh, seeing you build your own project with Rated, so which is what we're here to talk about today. But yeah, let's let's start with the the classic basics of you know how did you get into crypto and uh, ended up where you are today. Cool. Um, so first touch with, uh, with crypto started in 2013. I used to live with uh, a really good friend of mine. He found out about Bitcoin and he started talking about it nonstop, uh, started building stuff, talked about it even more. Um, initially, I thought he was kind of nuts uh, and didn't really get it. But then the more we talked about it, the more I got it, but didn't really pay attention too much. When it really clicked for me was in 2015. Um, I'm Greek originally. And so in 2015 was the worst part of the, the, the decade-long crisis, effectively, that, that Greece was in. And in 2015, we had capital controls come in. Huge referendum. Should we stay in the European Union? Should we break away? That means also like leaving the monetary union, issuing our own currency. Um, and so capital controls was this really gut-wrenching period, if you will, for, for Greek society at large. It like crippled the economy. All the young people left, but like there are there are really visceral images that I still have sort of in my mind of very long lines of pensioners around each ATM that you see like on the on the street driving around, We're talking about, you know, 50 people, hundred people, blocks, like whole blocks uh, worth of 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 lines. Uh, waiting to get their weekly ration of money. Uh, and, and so at that point, like I had the sort of the light bulb moment regarding Bitcoin. I was like, okay, I get it now. Non-state money. You're not beholden to uh, this idea of, you know, institutions and, and, and the way institutions work uh, in, you know, the modern financial system. Um, and, and I really found that appealing. So then started, you know, researching more, but again, not, not being like very involved. It all sort of came together in 2017 with, uh, with Ethereum, uh, for me and, and this whole idea of, you know, applications that you're, you're able to build on, on a platform that has like the properties of Bitcoin, but then can extend this logic sort of arbitrarily, right? Like the vision of the, the world computer and so on. So spent the whole year just researching stuff, trading, uh, trying to build uh, things with, with friends. But by the end of it, I looked back and I was like, well, you're having like so much fun and you resonate with like the whole mission of, of self-sovereignty and just building something better than kind of the, uh, the, the alternatives, which is kind of what is the status quo. Uh, and I decided to commit myself full-time to the space. So uh, I got a job with a fund called Decentral Park Capital. They were just starting out back then. I was the the first hire that they made uh, as an analyst. I stayed with them for three years, made a bunch of investments, built a pretty expansive data platform while at the fund when you know Dune didn't exist. Token Analyst was uh, like one of the one of the earlier uh, data companies that were looking at blockchain analytics specifically. Uh, and helped them raise a $75 million fund too. And then I left uh, and I joined this startup called uh, Bison Trails, which at the time that I joined uh, was, I was, think I was employee number 20 or so. Uh, I was a protocol specialist there. Um, I think I was the second ever person to be called a protocol specialist uh, in, in the industry. Although I know you, you, you have been doing like very, similar work in your, in your history, in the, in the space. So the first was Victor was my colleague who, who hired me in basically and at Bison Trails as it was validators as a service, right? That's what we were building. We ended up building a pretty 
large platform. I think at the top of the market, it was you know north of $30 billion on, on platform. A year later, we're acquired by, uh, by Coinbase. And, and then I stayed there for, for another year before I branched out on, on my own to found, found Rated with my, uh, my co-founder, Ars. But, you know, super happy to talk to you about, uh, you know, the internals of, of, of the story there. But uh, I want to I wanna let you ask whatever questions Thank you. Thank you for that background. Yeah, it's really interesting to see you like witnessing and I guess firsthand in Greece and, and how how it meandered to where you are now. Like seeing blocks of pensioners and now you're seeing blocks on, on the Ethereum chain being full. <laughs> Hopefully. Um so yeah, I, I guess you know what stands out to me is like your you've been always like in this sort of space around data and 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 um obviously that's sort of what rated is focused on so um maybe just to start can you explain to us you know what what is rated and sort of what are the the products you are building and sure so the whole thing that we're building we we fit it under a, a, a one liner which is reputation for machines uh and this is like a really charged term you can fit like a lot of a lot of scope in it, but really like the the mission of, of what we're doing is just providing transparency into the infrastructure layer of blockchains, right? And we've, we've started with Ethereum. Now, where this is coming from, like the why are we doing this ties actually in pretty well with, you know, 2015 and those lines of, of pensioners and so on. Um, I'm here, I'm doing what I'm doing. I got involved in this space because I really do think that we have sort of an opportunity to build something better, something more compelling, something more transparent by default. But also transparency is not handed to you, right? It's like, sure, the, the source material is open. Anybody could theoretically just go and access the data. But without the interpretation layer, you're really not improving much. Right. And, and, and the beauty of, of blockchains is that actually they allow you to go and get the data, but obviously, you know, interpretation doesn't come out of the, of the box. So on a long enough time frame, I think we're working on systems and we're building systems that are by default a lot better than uh, what the financial system, for example, is, is, is running on. And I also do think that it is a matter of time until things migrate to the systems that we're working on. Um, now, how much time that is going to be, that's another story. It could be 10 years, it could be 20 years, but I think the fundamental properties of the things that we're working on are undeniably orders of magnitude better than, than, than the alternatives. So if you then take that to be true, then I also don't want to imagine that world where we don't have transparency and visibility into kind of the the layer that guarantees it all the layer that actually packages transactions intents whatever that is and transitions it you know from a want to be done state to a done state it, it there, there is a protocol there are rules to be followed but also like rules can be broken and uh, actors that operate the protocol and the base layer could act selfishly and acting selfishly means that you you impose a negative externality on everybody else that is not only everybody else that's around you and that's honest and that's acting as they're supposed to be acting or expected to be acting, but also everybody that transacts on uh, the uh, the top layer, which are really like the most important uh, part of the uh, the whole the whole equation. So that's what we're largely here to do. That's the, that's the mission. This is why reputation for machines, right? And how you get to reputation is by indexing and contextualizing and building and, and dispelling the subjectivity of what is necessarily good and what is bad, but also what is, right? Just, just merely providing the context of what is happening, what has happened, how what is happening fits in the context in, of, of, of what has happened. And is this behavior like expected or or not, or what even constitutes a behavior? Uh, that's that's all the work that we're doing with data. So it's at the moment we're operating on 
on Ethereum. We we started with Ethereum because it is, I think, the most consequential uh, piece of infrastructure on blockchains out there by users, by developers, by uh, assets that are powering the uh, the infrastructure and so on. Um, and we currently host a network explorer where uh, the index is not the block, it's actually uh, the operator. So we're uh, basically contextualizing how Ethereum infrastructure works. And then you can be as granular as the validator index, but then we're providing sort of abstractions in terms of um, you know, node operators and, and different pools and how these pools are composed of node operators and then all the way up to sort of the global uh, network state um, with the ability to actually like zoom in down to like the, the, the most granular unit of account, which I suppose is the validator index at this stage. We also have an API, which uh, basically serves the data that you can sort of see on, on the Explorer, but also way, way more to build interfaces, to power financial products that serve the infrastructure layer. Um, and we also recently released an Oracle, which is a gateway for us to bring the contextualizations that we uh, we curate uh, on chain and actually be able to like power a suite of products uh, on you know the Ethereum uh, mainnet execution uh, layer. Yeah, that's that's super interesting. I I I guess most people the the block explorer is essentially like the portal into the the crypto space, right? Like many people's interactions with like when they first use crypto, I mean, aside from the wallet, it's probably like looking at Etherscan and look at, looking at their transaction. And it's it's quite powerful because like, yeah, like you said, right? And initially everything is open, theoretically accessible, but like, how do you actually do it in practice? So um, I guess Etherscan like, was like kind of the first wave there to like really um, do it on the transaction level and maybe did the application layer. And from what I understand, you are very focused on on this infrastructure layer for the proof of stake like chain how does it work on the on the very bottom layer and and is that going back on your like sort of uh experience in bison trails or um yeah could, could we say that is, is that how you, you totally yeah. um so like the origins of 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 rated uh, go all the way back to I guess October 2020. So I had joined Bison. It was like uh, six months in, or maybe a little bit less. Um, and then the Beacon Chain was launching at the end of the year, and the Ethereum Foundation uh, put together a hackathon, and the brief was do anything with all the data that the Medasha uh, testnet produced, and that's the last. Um, testnet before the beacon chain infamous for like a, a prism bug uh, with like an update that they they pushed that had a, a Cloudflare clock uh, to run side by side with like the validator's own like sense of of time and then it just like wiped out I think one third of the of the network's validators uh, at that point great that it happened in a testnet uh, and I guess that's that's what testnets are for so um uh, my myself and, and and my friend Sid Shaker, he was back then I think the uh, CTO of of Token Analyst, and they had they had just been acquired by Coinbase, um, if I remember correctly. So we we sat down and we basically went on a two week sprint where we just really took all the data that the um, the network produced and we did like a very expansive report on anything that happened from like, you know, client syncing times, like even off-chain data to storage, to how kind of the, the, the clients and the nodes behaved uh, over uh, over like a, a span of like two weeks, which is basically like when we run the, the research to slicing and dicing and diving super, super deep in all the on-chain data that we got. So you can, I think you can still find it on eth2data.github.io. It was still called eth2 back then. So we uh, did this hackathon. We keep, we won silver prize, uh, I think, um, and we learned a ton from that. Uh, we we learned that there's like so much wealth of of data about the network, and there is so little definition of actually how you can make this data useful. We learned things like, you know, performance 
externalities, risk, but like primarily performance and, you know, the risk and externalities thing was a, was sort of a realization that came a little bit later, but it's very subjective, right? Like people were measuring no common language on what performance actually means. So is it uptime, rewards, is it something else? Um, no, no clear answers. And then kind of over time, as I kind of went about my, uh, my, my work at, at Bison Trails and, you know, we were operating on north of 30, uh, networks, uh, I think 40, 45, 50, maybe more. I kind of saw this issue everywhere around me. Like it was a very narrow slice of, 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 of value in the world that I was, I was looking at, but as kind of someone operating in that industry, I didn't know how well we're doing altogether. I didn't know how well we're doing versus our network neighbors or competition or whatever you want to call that. I didn't know how the network is doing. I didn't even know how to articulate or, I mean, at least I had like some sense, but in general, it was like, again, pretty hard to even articulate what it means to do well and what it means to not do well and compare it, compare it against what. And then I started thinking, well, if this thing is going to be super successful and run incredibly consequential things on top of it, uh, 1% of the world's transactions in finance, commerce, media, I don't know, you name it, that cannot be the case, right? It, it, ca it cannot run on um, something that is amorphous and not like very well articulated, right? And then at the same time, you know, you, you, you know it as well as, as, as anyone, um, proof of stake grew from what some, I don't know, hundreds of millions of assets staked to the, the height of the market at some like over $300 billion at stake, which is like a massive number uh, in, in the span of like, you know, three and a half years uh, or so and a massive increase. So you're like, there is so much at, at stake, quite literally, and so little data about what is at stake and so so little understanding and then also like extrapolating forward then then you're like well you know that that stake element and nodes in general are important they are important because they they help these networks run if these networks are going to be valuable and they are to different degrees then security at that layer is important the well functioning of a network is important how do we but but also like the the assets themselves the nodes are valuable because um, they do jobs and they produce future cash flows. They're like, you know, it's inflationary rewards, it's transactions, it's like all kinds of things. So we can actually like, then you think you can actually build products out of that. And in order to like help the industry move forward, you need credit for those things. You need insurance for those things. You need like, you know, potentially even derivatives, right? Like you can do like lots of cool things to hopefully not gamble, but like provide levers for people to like operate businesses in that, in that space and actually contribute to running infrastructure for really, really, really important, uh, uh, constructions. Right. So, um, and then, and then I started thinking, well, you need like a third party independent guardian of all that data to actually help power all of these products that you foresee in the future, because you know, a credit underwriter's, for example, job is not to wrangle blockchain data. Their job is to underwrite credit and, and do that 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 type of uh, type of work, right? Equally with with insurance, so on. So this is this was kind of like the initial impetus uh, for for starting rated. I was also like relatively good with with data historically. Like I built this data platform at the at the fund. Uh, when not much existed out there through that thing, I ended up being like one of Dune's earliest uh, users before starting until until I started the company. I think I was number three on the you've been dropping on the leaderboard. Uh, but then I got like <laughs> I got eaten alive. You know, it was, uh, it's like you gotta you gotta run just to stay still, and you know got 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 to work closely with 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 Frederick and Matt there as like one of their earliest users feedback blah, 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 all, all all that stuff um so it, it felt like a natural sort of extension of my work 
uh, putting putting infrastructure and, and and data together and 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 seeing what we can we can build. So, I guess I guess here we are. Yeah, that, it's super interesting because, yeah, like from experience, many operators like sort of struggle maybe. So you have like these different users, I guess, right? Like the operator itself wants to understand better how they are doing, maybe serve their clients data on their rewards and like might end up trying to build some of these systems themselves. But then, you know, you know, all the other operators have that same problem and you're not the best like project, obviously, like, because you might not want to share that data. You just want to do it for yourself. So like, obviously there is also a need for a third party. And then I think, so you basically have the side of the, so the, like, if you think about the users for rated, right? One is like the, the stakers or the operators, or can you like sort of talk about it in, in those layers, you know, who is the consumer of rated data um, and what are they using it for? Definitely. I'm going to talk to you first about kind of what, what I see in like very, very high level and then, and then go down to like the nitty gritty presently, who's using us, how they're using us and so on. So I sort of see us in the middle of a possible network, right? Of networks themselves, node operators that run these networks, capital and applications. And there are like... E if you think about things today without rated in the picture, these are all connected, right? These are all sort of nodes in a broader ecosystem that are connected with one another. And, and what they sort of exchange uh, between one another is distribution, legitimacy, and data, right? And we can sort of exist in the middle of that. We can basically help facilitate a bunch of implicit value transfers uh, implicit, like in the, in, in the broader sense, and make them explicit, help them actually materialize easier, more systematically, and thereby, hopefully, just inviting more of that. Now, all the way back to like where we are today and the products that we have on, on Ethereum, we can, can and we do serve node operators, and the use cases there are anything from, you know, rewards accounting, to performance monitoring or just being sort of a, a, a second source of truth to your internal monitoring, for example, to uh, performance benchmarking and understanding how well you're doing versus your, your peers and so on. And I think increasingly more so, there's like this I idea that we have of just becoming a data co-op effectively, maybe explicit, maybe um, implicit, but, you know, a shared cost center effectively for node operators where your job is not to wrangle data necessarily. But also like, you know, there are node operators out there that have these capabilities, but it's, it's sort of awkward to think that, you know, now they're actually powering another node operators reward accounting or, or performance benchmarking, or even like the credit products and the accounting products and the in insurance products and so on. Cause there is like a large surface for, for moral hazards there. And if that sort of actually transpires, then we're no better than sort of the mistakes that, that have been made in, in previous iterations of, of the matrix, right? The other uh, part of, of, of our, our user base is pools. And more broadly, it's capital allocators, right? Because in, you know, in proof of stake, as you know, stake is one part of the equation. So how does capital get allocated into these, uh, into these node operators? So we're working with, with several pools like Lido, Liquid Collective, we're working with Stator. And the things that we're helping there is with, with the tools that we've built to better manage the active set, both in terms of deciding like who is onboarded onto the active set and who might be offboarded one day. I don't think we've seen offboarding from active sets yet, but it's natural to think is that this industry matures, these things are not going to stay static, right? Like, I mean, specifically in Ethereum, you couldn't even withdraw up until April 2023. So for the first two and a half years of, of, of the Beacon Chain's existence. So even just ev evicting someone from the set was really like not possible. But I'm sure that eventually we'll, we'll see those things and then, you know, uh, compositions of active sets changing. 
as a manager, as like a custodian, as a steward, as a whatever you want to call it, as like, you know, this could be a DAO, this could be a company, it could be, uh, it could be an interface, whatever that is. You have to make decisions about the well functioning of your, uh, of your set. And so understanding what the, that well functioning is, uh, and making decisions is all powered by data. And this is what we're, what we're helping and seek to do more of, uh, these, these pools, uh, with thirdly, you have applications. And these are applications that basically reference the infrastructure layer, uh, to create new value, right? And that could be credit, for example, like, so think, think in terms of, we haven't, we haven't really announced it yet, but we're, we're working in partnership with, uh, with, with a credit fund to actually, uh, trial out uncollateralized credit for node operators based on their accounts receivable. So you think of it as pipe for, for validators. There's a predictable stream of, uh, rewards and transaction fees that they earn. And thereby you could, uh, actually monetize that revenue at a premium to sort of the interest rate that you earn on the beacon chain. Um, there are interfaces that we're powering with our API to help capital that sits on the other end, make better decisions along the lines of, okay, where am I, uh, allocating my capital to which operators am I putting my capital to? monitoring it on an ongoing basis, revisiting that decision and so on. And then you'd think that, you know, oh yeah, just like, I just want some APR, give me the maximum APR, uh, and, and, and then, you know, see you in a year or whatnot. Sure. Um, that's how things really started, I think. But then the more the industry grows, the more the industry matures, the more other factors are going to come into play, right? It's like risk versus reward. Then you have things like eigenlayer, you have more risk, you have like, you know, risk starting to sandwich on top of like pre-existing risk and so on. So without like a um, well-contextualized data world in, in, in that paradigm, you can't even articulate those things. So, and I like to think that we're playing like a, like a, like a virtuous role in, in the ecosystem by helping people actually like articulate those things. So far it's been, it's been a pretty, uh, it's been a pretty, uh, pretty exciting journey to get here. That's, that's definitely the case for me. I think I also like, I mean, in the end, you see a lot of times the rated data, the aggregate data being used in like these sort of discussions around decentralization, maybe, right? Like now we talked a lot about contextualization, maybe mostly on, in terms of like performance and, you know, is the operator doing well, there's like these objective things, but there's also the wider goal of like, I guess, credibly neutrality, credible neutrality of the network and, um, maybe geographic diversification, yes. which you are also looking at that, like the end user being more the, the wider network, right. Uh, which I think is like a very nice outcome, right. You're kind of getting maybe money from the people that want to like optimize the performance, but also providing this, this public good of, you know, what is the, the state of decentralization in the, in the network. And I think, you know, there's like really really interesting things to see there. If you'd visit rated.network, which we'll also link in the show notes, you'll, you'll be able to see that for Ethereum, you know, like all these, uh, the things that, that if try to keep Ethereum neutral or like decentralized, like you can like actually check, is it actually happening? So maybe, um, thinking about that, maybe can you like, yeah, talk a little bit about how you think about it and how you, how you see the current state of Ethereum in terms of like its goal of uh, becoming credibly neutral is, is it actually happening like from, from the data you're seeing or where are maybe like things that need to like be worked on since I guess you were like probably one of the people that has like the, the deepest insight there. I think that it would be nice to focus on that dimension. I, I think Ethereum is on a, is on a really great path. It's obviously messy and hard and sometimes like undefined in terms of like where you're at, uh, and how you're tracking in terms of your, of your goals. But I think undeniably it's like on the, on that right path. Right. 
Um, and I, I'd like to also think that we're helping just push that conversation forward, right? Like I, I, I still remember um, when we were starting out, when we first launched, so we, I think we first launched the website in February, 2022, then March, April, around that like two months period, it was like a big conversation about client diversity. So I think Prism at the time uh, had 80% dominance or, or, or something of that, of that nature. And we had just launched. The, the first feature that we, we, we delivered on, on the front end, which is based off of um, uh, Michael Sproul's work on, on Blockprint, which is basically an open source tool that fingerprints the proposal patterns of, of validators and, and works backwards to uh, identify which client they're wearing effectively. And so we actually pushed that out on the, on the front end and then we started getting shared all over Twitter. It's like client diversity, client diversity, and now here's like a way to actually measure client diversity. Since then, client diversity has massively improved. We're now, I'm just looking at the slash uh, overview uh, screen on, on the Explorer and we've, we've gone from like 80% uh, Prism to like 40% Prism, Lighthouse is at like 35%, Tech was at 17%, and then the smaller clients, Nimbus and Lodestar, are actually like improving. We, I'm not claiming we were responsible for it, but I like to think that, you know, we had, we helped. And and that's all we can we can really hope hope to do, right? Just give people the tools to make make the right decisions, whatever the right decision is for for their objective function. Also, like in terms of another stated goal of Ethereum, I guess is resilience, right? And and just surviving like a catastrophic event in terms of censorship, in terms of war, in terms of like nuclear holocaust, and 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 so on. And since the beginning, Ethereum had like a very strong focus. Uh, in solo staking, right? Staking from from home, which is kind of antithetical to like the whole proof of stake thing from when you look at things from bottom up, right? Because proof of stake is part capital or like one half capital. Capital is dominated by power laws. So like just crushing those those power laws is very, very difficult. Um, but, you know, if you if you transport yourself back in time and you think, you know, when the Beacon Chain was launching or even before it was launching and what the conversation was shaped around is like, you know, validators are going to run from fridges and everybody's going to run a validator at home. And so it turns out it's like, it's actually not that easy, right? Uh, 32 ETH is a lot of money these days for, for the average Joe or Jane. It's the interfaces, I mean, with things like Dapnode and so on, like tremendous progress in making the whole solo staking thing more accessible, but it still is pretty daunting. Like, what happens if my validator, am I going to get slashed? Am I not going to get slashed? Like, education around this whole thing. It's not like I buy a pack of candy, no pun intended, from, you know, the kiosk or, or whatnot. It's actually like it takes like a, a pretty long learning curve and you either have to be very committed to some higher order goal uh, to, to be part of it um, or you're just incredibly interested in sort of the nuts and bolts of it for whatever idiosyncratic uh, reason. Again, like these two things don't make for like a hugely available market sandwich on top, like the capital requirement and everything it actually like is a, is a pretty small segment. But we have found that be that as it may, Ethereum does have about 6.5% of all the validators that are active on the beacon chain being solo stakers, which is a, a tremendous Outcome, right? That's like in the billions of of dollars running on 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 people's homes, uh, and so on. And and more interestingly, even like if you if you now change the denominator from amount of stake that is running to beacon nodes, which are sort of think of it as the box that is running those validators, and you can run like many validators on a one box. It's probably like our our best estimate there is twenty five percent of the network, which is tremendous for like a proof of stake network where really important stuff runs on, sure, it might not be 50%, it might not be 70%, but I'd contend that even if it was 6% of the boxes, that's an amazingly resilient long tail of operators where if the large operators that have a lot of capital and are visible companies and so on are easier to shut down in an event of like extreme censorship, that lasts 
line of defense, which is running in like, you know, random homes or basements or I don't know where, all across the world uh, is, is an incredibly sort of resilient backbone that is demonstrably uh, helping Ethereum like achieve, achieve its goals. I think the last thing, the last stronghold that, uh, that, that remains is really, uh, you know, geographic uh, distribution and increasing, increasing that and uh, execution client uh, diversity. So Geth is, 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 you know, still the dominant client. Something goes wrong with Geth, then the network will, will experience, uh, you know, sour times. Like I think it was just this week or maybe uh, late last week when Geth had a, an issue with block production and then together with how Prism actually decides where to build the blocks when, when the validators are, are, are boosted. Uh, they actually kind of we, we saw the network experience its lowest effectiveness since uh, Chapella, which is uh, a book not really a frequent phenomenon. Like Ethereum is running really well uh, for for all intents and purposes. And again, like it was you know a two sigma event that didn't like no one bat an eyelid on the execution layer. If you were transacting on Ethereum, you wouldn't know that this thing was happening. Um, so, you know, there, there's still like work to do from like a network perspective. Uh, you know, we're, we're seeing that the network is actually like pretty heavily concentrated, you know, in North America and in Europe, particularly when it's relating to what we've sort of contextualized as professional operators and looking only at that slice of, of the network. But then, you know, you have things coming up like DVT. Uh, so, you know, Obol, uh, SSV, uh, Diva is working on a, a, a DVT, uh, solution of, of their own. I think there are a few more. So the idea there is that you can, you know, now separate sort of operation keys and custody keys, and then you can have these like fractional sort of staking schemes effectively. So you can, you know, you can airdrop a DAP node to someone in Africa and they can get started with like a very small amount of of collateral, you know, one ETH, half an ETH, whatever that might be. And then someone else basically puts, puts up the rest. So I'm generally hopeful. Now, is that going to be enough to quell basically the, the, the power law? Maybe not so, but it doesn't matter, right? What matters is how strong that backbone is because, you know, when, when push comes to shove, this is going to be the last line of defense. And, and, and that's what I think matters the most. Yes. Super interesting. Also, like just to see, hear about the, the practical issues right now, I think, yeah, there's so many layers that you theoretically want to have decentralized, right? And then every one of them is like on a different level on, on the spectrum. Sometimes it's even subjective, you know, is it decentralized? Many people have been like criticizing, for example, also like Lido to be like centralizing. But then again, right layer below, there is like 30 different operators operating in Lido, which can be overlooked if you just see like the 30% on, on even on rated, but you guys have like the drop down, right? And showing like the different operators that operate Lido, for example. That's right. Or even, even on, on client distribution, right? Like, so I, I think Chainsafe, that is the developer of uh, Lodestar, which is like the fifth uh, client that's available to run run Ethereum on, on validators and also like the, the one with the least penetration, they are now running some like 10,000 validators under Lido with Lodestar, right? That's, I believe, something that kind of Lido as the pool manager, the active set manager in that sort of neighborhood of, of, of Ethereum and it's like one one third at the time uh, we're, we're recording. Um, I don't necessarily think that this would have happened, like this, you know, increase in participation of Lodestar in the mix of clients would have happened if a pool manager like Lido didn't actually design for it, right? So there are like, there are benefits and I, it's, it's, it's a really hairy subject. I generally don't have strong views i try i try to be you know just the facts and like here's here's some data and you can make your own mind up 
I don't necessarily have like a, a strong view on whether, you know, having limits on pools and so on is like the, the right thing or the wrong thing. To some degree, it is the market that will eventually decide, right? And I don't know that even having like at least, you know, for my own disposition, that having like a certain opinion even matters. I see, I see positives, I see negatives, I see opportunities, and I see, I see risks, and I try, and I try to quantify them uh, as, as, as best as I can, and then also like, you know, offer it uh, to people to, to help them sort of make, make the best decision possible for, for, for the network. Yeah, extremely valuable. I think we can, building off the, the solo staker sort of discussion, and I guess the wider sort of state where Ethereum is at right now, I think one very relevant discussion as we're recording this is around uh, EIP 7514, right? So basically the amount of growth of staking that, that Ethereum is experiencing and sort of the design with 32 ETH per validator is like impacting a little bit the network performance. Uh, as from what I understand, so I think it would be helpful Maybe if you could explain a little bit the background of or what this change is about and, and why it's happening. And then maybe we can discuss a bit, you know, what the implications are after that. But maybe we just give it like a bigger overview of what of what this is about. I think it's been like in the news now. And I think it is quite relevant um, you know, for many network participants, including like the operators, of course, and uh, stakers themselves, right? Perhaps we should better set some some context for for listeners that that don't have it right. So, in Ethereum, uh, validators uh, are basically the the unit of account in consensus. It is kind of an instantiation of a watcher, a consensus participant that basically attests to the state of the network. I see things around me in the flattest, most dumb sense possible. I see things around me and I report what I saw, basically. Um, and then in order to have one of those virtual watchers or participants of consensus and so on, you need to have 32 ETH, right? 32 ETH enables one. Now, that doesn't mean that that one validator is also like a one machine. In fact, you can run like many of these validators on a one machine. Now, I, th I think the design originally was was as such to like you know help solo staking happen make it a little bit more difficult for concentration to happen you know as we've seen in delegated proof of stake these constraints don't necessarily exist and so it's it, it's much easier for power laws to actually uh instantiate right so design decisions made uh, at, at a time in the past for reasons and arguably the right reasons right or at least the right reasons for for ethereum now, the, the downside to that is that when you have a lot of interest in, in staking, you have people wanting to participate, you have increasingly more validators uh, joining the network, these, these digital instances of consensus uh, participants, which means that you have a lot more data that the network needs to handle. There's, you know, data that's being exchanged in the, P2P layer of the network, which is, you know, all those validators talking to one another and saying, I saw this, I saw this, I saw this, I saw this. Everybody saw something. And then there's like another consensus actor that's not like really explicit um, on chain that takes all of, like, what did everybody see? Okay, well, let's put it together. Like, what, what, is, what is reality? And reality tends to be what most people saw. But now you have like so much more of these messages being exchanged. Really, like it, it, it looks like the the people that were on the, you know, uh, the withdrawals are are, are bullish uh, and sort of an enabler rather than a, oh my God, like all the stake is going to flee the beacon chain. Uh, people were, were on the right side of history. So we've, we've basically seen like a 50% increase in active stake in the last six months uh, or maybe less. It's April now. It's we're recording at the end of, of, of September. So I think at... When withdrawals came, uh, that that upgrade uh, came to the fore. It was five hundred thousand active validators. Now we're at eight hundred thousand, 
right? And we're talking about 300,000 extra validators, which is more than 50% of, of what were active back then, that joined uh, the network in the last six months. It took the network two and a half years to get to 500. So if you're like, I mean, that's a concerning kind of trend, right? Like it could concerning from like a network load perspective, because then you see kind of like a straight line, but then you see that line accelerate and the curvature change. That sort of fits in an exponential curve. That's concerning because then there might be like an undo load for the network to process, which means that the network is going to underperform because it's not set up to actually handle this type of load of messages, then a bunch of like useless effectively, or let's not call it useless, but the marginal value that this extra message, I saw this brings is tiny, the more of, you know, the more of these messages you actually have. Uh, so in order to basically prevent the network from uh, experiencing hard times uh, in terms of infrastructure and networking and state bloat and, and, and all of these things, a decision was made to actually cap the validator uh, activation uh, uh, limit to eight validators per epoch, which I think was the number that uh, the network was at before withdrawals activated. It was seven or eight. I don't remember which one was. Uh, it was exactly. I think uh, right now that number has gone up to eleven. And basically, Ethereum works in a way that um, creates like a bottleneck on the way in and on the way out. The same rules that apply to the activation queue roughly apply uh, one to one to the exit queue as well. But basically, the bandwidth um, scales together with with demand, that bottleneck becomes wider uh, and, and relaxes as more demand sort of uh, comes to uh, the, the door um, effectively. And that bottleneck exists to also manage part of that whole data clutter and so on, but also to control stake in terms of it leaving as well, right? And suddenly Ethereum not only losing like a bunch of useful information or maybe not so useful information in terms of consensus and the well function of the chain, but also like a lot of security in terms of stake. So this uh, EIP, as I understand, is a sort of short-term solution to actually give the network some breathing room so that a more permanent decision can actually be made as to, okay, well, we have this real issue, you know, too many attestations, too much load on the P2P network, a bunch of like redundant information that just like bloats the, the state of the chain. What do we do about it? And so there are, again, like as a, as a person that's trying to be neutral and like look at, look at just the facts, I, I don't necessarily have like a, a strong view on whether this is good or, or bad. I can see like arguments on, on both sides, right? And, and the argument on, on the pro side is like, well, Let's buy ourselves some time with this, you know, not so intrusive change to the protocol, roll back to like a few months ago, the state of, of the queue two months ago and, and allow stake to trickle in more slowly so that we can buy some time to figure out what we're going to do eventually. But then on the other end, this creates at least when you're looking at the two states, right? Like, you know. 11 uh, validators per epoch versus eight validators per epoch, two states of the world moving from one to the other, you are disproportionately with that move favoring the status quo. Such that if, for example, there was a strong need or willingness of existing stake to be reallocated or new stake that onboards to go to places that are not dominant uh, in terms of their representation of stake in, in, in the beacon chain, now they have like less of the window for them to actually kind of catch up, uh, if you will, is narrower, which effectively buys time for whoever's in the lead. 
I don't know if there is like uh, value in 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 really kind of uh, diving a lot deeper into that or really ruminating on it on it that much because it's it's all very subjective. It's all in the eye of the 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 beholder. But the the problem is 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 still like existent, right? Like from a network perspective, from like a well functioning network health perspective, like that's a problem that we're going to have to solve eventually, right? And there's it rhymes well with like another proposal, which is like, okay, let's aggregate um, the state. Why do we need to have uh, 32 ETH per validator when we can just collapse that and do it, I don't know, 20 times, 50 times, 100 times more and just allow validators and validator operators that option. Not make it mandatory, keep the minimum at 32, but then you can add those 32 increments and instead of running various instances having many of these digital agents of consensus that send all these messages suddenly instead of 100 messages you could just have one but that also comes with like a whole world of of trade-offs and like largely like like all of these things are ends up being like a, a a political thing among among other things right which is you know people have made design decisions people have built technology and infrastructure to actually matters the state of the network as it is today, which might or might not be a competitive advantage. So I've made all of this effort uh, and built that that advantage and built all these, these capabilities. And now maybe they will be deemed uh, completely redundant, right? Or I will need to like retool a bunch of the things as I've, as, as I've worked with them. There's also like very credible, you know, arguments in terms of, okay, how do we handle slashings? Does the penalty sort of increased proportionately, which means that, well, I might fuck up the same way, excuse my my language, but uh, I might fail in the same way uh, that I do today, but instead, b- what is at stake, and the slashing penalty today is one ETH, uh, what's at stake is much larger. Um, whereas now, for example, like a correlated failure will be staggered and it will be one validator after another after another, which basically buys you time to actually address the issue before it kind of like causes contagion in like that one box or that one cluster of boxes that is running like all of these validators and so on. So, you know, real issues uh, that that don't really have clear-cut uh, answers. And that's both kind of, you know, the the beauty of it. And it, it's also sometimes what, uh, uh, what, you know, slows progress down right and it's again it's a world of it's a world of trade-offs yeah definitely like thanks so much for elaborating like this on it i i do think it's very interesting how you know these dynamics that you mentioned are like sort of like one on one hand like favoring in a way the power loss by like sort of limiting how many new can enter and that's like sort of a result of this design choice to that actually tries to kind of achieve the opposite, right? By like help, helping solar stakers to stake. So it's a really interesting trade-off space. And I, and I do think maybe the solution could also be, right? Like, because of like we're saying, it's it's a temporary solution. So like something needs to change. And it seems like, or from my perspective, one of the only things I guess that I have seen is that sort of increasing that limit or aggregating the validators in some sense. So I do think what's also interesting is that maybe you can do that, but then also you have like solutions like DVT that maybe like can still maintain like the ability for solo stakers to sort of participate even if they don't have because already 32 ETH, like you said, is already maybe too much for many these days. And actually, so if it's even higher, I guess maybe DVT can be the layer that like sort of solves that and it, it wouldn't like blow the Ethereum state so much. But um yeah, very interesting field. And yeah, I guess also yeah. cool to have like all these teams like working on different parts of it and you you sort of, you know, making it all transparent and like contextualizing it. I think that's like a, a very cool spot that you're in. We're trying our, our hardest, but just to harp on what you, where you left off for, for, for a little while longer, like the, the flip side of having all of those teams work together in in like loosely or less loosely connected ways and no sort of central planner that just explicitly says like, you know, this is what should be done. And it all kind of like basically gets done in, you know, a network of of, of influence. 
uh, effectively, is that you have the bloat situation, right? Or you keep you just keep adding features to something because that's sort of the natural impulse to do. But then you have like like a like a strong contingent of like client developers and so on actually advocating for a cleanup fork. Let's not do like all the sort of improvement stuff and add this and then, you know, DVT comes into the picture and then other components come into the picture and then complexity just like piles up because again, that's the natural impulse of like humans to build features uh, and not not to like actually reduce features. Reducing features is, is, is painful. Uh, it means that you have to like roll back your decision that you made earlier. It means that you have to like accept the mistake, admit defeat. And also it's, it's, it's generally more, more painful to do that, but very necessary. So it's just so fascinating, right? Just seeing, seeing humans just work together in like implicit ways at this level of, of, of scale. Yeah, it's just really fascinating. Yeah, and I guess like one spicy topic we had there before we started recording I guess it's also like, yeah, how are these decisions then made in the end? You know, like Ethereum is known to be like sort of a advocate against, or like, I guess the Ethereum community at large. And I mean, maybe who, who even is that, right? But like, I guess also Vitalik and some of the core early people uh, sort of against this sort of notion of on-chain governance, like making the tokens decide. But then we can definitely see in this case, for example, that these choices are made by some of the core developers or in some way, right, the decisions are made, but they're potentially not like taking into account the people that this change is impacting, right, in in a way that maybe other systems would. And I think that's that's also very interesting now to see how, how these things play out as, you know, many have critiqued the on-chain governance, but actually like here, I, I feel like it's a very good um, example of, why maybe this other path isn't like working as well either right so you yeah i i guess if you want to comment on that like what how how are you thinking about this you've covered there are no good options we're, we're we live in a world of like bad options uh when, when it comes to this right like it's look at governance like at, outside of, of chains or whatnot it's not like things are rosy there or that like we've solved that problem as like a, a human civilization so we, we just have to live with like bad options and it's also like there's precedent of on-chain governance actually like not being a solution like there was a a, a tezos upgrade i think was their sixth or seventh upgrade maybe like already two years back there was like a big debate about an escape hatch feature and then the upgrade wouldn't like actually go through it's a very political process with Ethereum, as, as 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 you mentioned earlier, there is no like explicit on-chain governance, and I don't even know that like explicit on-chain governance is is the answer. So governance happens in a uh, in a rough way, right? The Ethereum community calls that rough consensus, uh, where you know ecosystem participants call it the client teams, the Ethereum Foundation, the operators, and so on. They're all in like you know three or four different forums, not including sort of all the all the private chats and, and and IRL places and so on. But it's, you know, I guess it's ETH research. It's like a couple other forums. It's like a, a couple discords and so on. They discuss those issues uh, at, at large, right? Like upgrade issues. What are we doing? How are we moving forward and so on? What ultimately happens is that if the operators don't decide to upgrade the software, even if like all the client developers, for example, agree and like the protocol researchers and protocol developers agree, to like push the change forward. If the operators don't upgrade their nodes to the new version, then the network doesn't upgrade, right? What is like a little bit under talked about perhaps, and also maybe a little bit spicy is that these operators have a lot of stake on the line, right? Like they have their actual stake. They have uh, businesses that they've built on top of that they're they're effectively like, not not custodians, but they're agents of the stake of others, right? So there is like really like a lot on the line for them. And so ultimately, if they're if they if they did have like even as a solo staker, if you did have like a deeply rooted belief about like a specific feature, which you know I, even saying it that way sounds like a little bit ridiculous, but you know so be it. It's like if if this if this infrastructure is as important as we all think it is and as important as as it will be, like being sort of religiously militant about features 
um, that actually makes some sense. Um, so the point is that even if you were like vehemently against, your 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 stake is uh, at risk if you're in the uh, you know if you're in the less representative side. So you know what happens like if you follow right 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 you know the other chain Ethereum Classic or whatnot. For state classic, like you know, what happens to like your 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 value at risk? So you know, again, really dense, not only technical, like in fact, far far from technical uh, issues that have no no clear uh, answers. But I I will say that you know Ethereum has gone pretty far, further than most, if not all with that model of uh, of governance uh that it's that it's got so you you have to acknowledge you know success when 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 you see it right 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 yeah definitely i yeah that's it's a super interesting discussion like you said it's far from technical and it's uh something that we haven't solved as as civilizations anywhere really i do think you know yeah you have that extreme option like you mentioned of forking but obviously that's yeah, like not really a tool for like day-to-day -day operating like this sort of network, right? It's like in a very rare situation, maybe that will, you will like sort of play that card. But I guess, you know, um, some sort of formalization of this governance, to me at least, feels like is potentially like a direction that is maybe underexplored in Ethereum also. I, I do think yeah, in other places, maybe it was formalized too early and like not <laughs> well enough, but... Uh, I guess seeing some more effort there, I feel like is a big area um, that, yeah, one needs to like talk about more or like uh, build or like discuss what 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 could be done. Um, but yeah, so thanks for this like sort of expedition into that direction. I guess we're already talking for quite a bit, so wanted to end it on the notes about rated again. So we've been talking a lot about Ethereum. Obviously, you guys are very focused on on Ethereum. But uh, the broader vision, right, is very reputation for machines. So there's like obviously other machines aside from Ethereum validators. Um, what's your, yeah, sort of what's the future for Rated? How are you thinking about what you're building and how you're expanding maybe from Ethereum? Or are you even doing that? Player tools, who knows? Um, if you have agreed to just, yeah, talk to us a little bit about that, then, then we can wrap up. Awesome. Uh, so we are, as we've discussed, present on Ethereum today. This is where we, we started from, but the vision is, is, is much larger than that. Uh, it's potentially like as large as Ethereum can and will get and, and, and even bigger. So it just coming from, from the background that I did and, and having worked with people across many different networks and having kind of like interfaced with these, these networks, I, I see value in like plur plurality. Right, and I I do see a future of of multiple different networks that have different core value propositions of different layer twos, and I'm you know multi uh, chain multi network maxi I suppose. Although this might be like a somewhat contrarian view to have uh, at the time that we're we're recording because it's like the the deep of the deep in in the bear market and and you know it's it's hard sometimes to see kind of like the the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, so what, what we're planning to do in, in the coming quarters is actually expand to multiple proof of stake networks, uh, the Solanas of the world, the Cosmos of the world, the polygons of the world, and thereafter to expand to actually covering multiple agent sets. So not only validators, but there are many node types that actually have very similar properties. They participate in networks. They produce useful work. They earn rewards or a fee stream. They participate in a fee stream for the useful work that they produce. They are agents in networks and they're entrusted with sort of missions and they might be fulfilling their missions successfully, not so successfully, not at all. They might be uh, inflicting positive externalities in the context of their networks or negative externalities by taking undue risk uh, and, and, and so on. So, you know, I think by just doing what we're doing 
in multiple networks and, and, and going into all these different environments, not only can we help these networks just be better, achieve their, their goals better. I like one more, like little, little anecdote. I, I ran the numbers at some point and, and I looked at, you know, the historical effectiveness of the Ethereum network on the whole. And it turns out that apart from the merge, which was a very volatile uh, month, uh, effectively, the network hasn't had a lower effectiveness month than the month that we launched. Now, again, I'm not like uh, saying we are wholeheartedly and, 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 and uniquely responsible for that outcome, but I do think that we've had a small part to play, right? It, by contextualizing, by surfacing like uh, information about performance transparently and 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 in an easy to uh, access and, and and understand way. So I I do think that we you know there's benefits in actually having that unified view, uh, common abstractions in terms of you know what is performance, what is rewards, what is risk that are virtuous for for these networks. There's a lot of work to do. Uh, there's a lot of scope. There's a lot of complexity. It's a big infrastructure build. Uh, and then, you know, while your ability of uh, adding the marginal network might improve over time and the cost of doing that drops, then there's there's another like more insidious curve that you don't get to actually uh, realize until after some time, which is like maintenance and, and, and cost and, and scope, right? So these are all very challenging things. And also there's there's another challenge in that there might be, and I think there are, more networks and more agent sets than a one company might be able to cover, right? And then you end up being in a in a situation where you know you're you as the as the company or the organization or whatever you're in in that boat, and then you know there's three holes, and then there's a fourth hole, and there's a fifth hole, and then you have like to cover the fifth hole, you have to just Open Play twister. Open another one, right? Just move your hand from like <laughs> one to the other, and then exactly, <laughs> it's the it's it's the whack a mole analogy that we 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 talked about before before the recording. So um, that's going to be a challenge. Figuring out how to solve for that is going to be a challenge, but it's a challenge I'm super super excited um, to be to be taking on because because you know we see the positive impact of 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 the work. That we're doing and and that is sort of the, the biggest reward uh of 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 all uh if you will so just being able to have like a like a small contribution to things moving forward to things improving to arming people with the right of an arming might be like the the wrong word but but giving people the ability to access information and empower them to make good decisions for whatever their objective function is is something I can, you know, get behind and continue doing for a very long time. So I'm excited. I'm excited to, uh, to be on the path that, that we're on and I'm excited to, to explore where it takes us. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much, Elias, for like the inspiring conversation. You'll, you'll die on this hill. We, we get that <laughs> after this. <laughs> you will die on this. I've I will not. die on this hill. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, yeah. I mean, appreciate it, Felix. Again, yeah. Thanks so much for coming on Epicenter. I, I, I hope this, yeah, very, very interesting episode about Ethereum, about infrastructure, and these um, will add to the show notes like a bunch of the things that were mentioned in this episode. So yeah, our listeners can find out more there. And yeah, hope to see you soon. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Huge, huge fan. <laughs>